hands. Good morning, everyone. Welcome for being here. Thanks for attending this press conference. I am Antoine Gillot, coordinator of the Observatory of Climate Non-State Action, and this is Ronan Nantec, president of the Climate Change Association. Just a few, few words to introduce uh, this presentation of our FAO's uh, international report about uh, uh, emission and uh, gas emission. Uh, in the galaxy of uh, the different NGO who, who try to tackle uh, climate change to mobilize, uh, climate change uh, is an NGO who try to mobilize together all the different non-state actors, not just uh, local government or, or company, but all together to uh, create uh, dynamic, to exchange best practices uh, and to analyze uh, evolution of uh, CO2 emission. For example, today, climate change organized in Africa the most uh, important uh, events uh, with the different non-state actors. Uh, we was uh, in Agadir four years ago, in Accra two years ago, and in next September will be uh, in Dakar for a very, very important uh, meeting. This uh, fourth report, of course, it's an important report because uh, we must analyze now uh, how uh, CO2 emissions evolve after uh, COVID uh, crisis. The, the report of uh, climate change, it's uh, in French, the, the Saint-Thomas report. We don't analyze just commitment, but we analyze the reality of action on the field of the different non-state actor, and we cross this action, of course, with the the framework of the legal frameworks in the countries, the financial mobilization, and we try to have this uh, clear vision of uh, the evolution of, of emission. What are the most principal uh, uh, vision uh, for, for this uh, year? I give the floor to Antoine Gillot to present uh, this report. Thank you, Renaud. So uh, we're pleased to announce the release of the Global Synthesis Report on Climate and State Action by Sectors, the fourth edition in November the 29th. Today we will introduce you the 10 key takeaways of its summary for decision makers. So let's start with uh, a, a global picture of global emissions. Greenhouse gases emissions have dropped by record height levels in 2020 before bouncing back in uh, 2021 due to economic recovery. This is the global picture, but it masks some different regional profiles regarding the depth of the rupture provoked by the pandemic with previous trends in emissions. That's what we try to outline in the slide that you are watching. Dependency on coal and fossil fuels especially clear uh, 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 draw a clear line um, between those countries uh, which are slightly turning away from them and those which keep supporting coal and fossil fuels through public subsidies. Um, China, in particular, blows hot and cold on the global energy mix. Although it is at the origin of almost half of additional solar and wind power capacities, and it proves really to stop investing in coal-fired power stations overseas, China is the country that is behind 80% of new coal-fired electricity production capacities in 2020. And studies show that shifts in consumption patterns and expansion of middle and rich classes can generate an exponential growth of carbon footprint and emission from households in the country. So the different regional profiles and inner contradiction within national uh, uh, situations lead to a dire observation. There is no real transition at global level in terms of a clear movement of substitution of carbon intensive options for production and consumption to uh, low carbon means. The trend of the period is rather one of accumulation of both. Never has the world consumed as much coal and renewables and new type of cars are adding to uh, uh, conventional ones. Electric heating systems for buildings are adding to uh, fossil fuel electric uh, heating systems. It means that in regional and sectoral levels, there is flows, 
feeding these accumulations that are sometimes indeed undergoing some form of transition. E-mobility, for instance, is picking up in Europe and in China. Uh, solar power uh, boomed in 2020 in Vietnam, and renewables become increasingly more competitive compared to fossils. But the situation is that we added 60 gigawatt of fossil fire capacity in 2020 and 260 gigawatt of renewables. These uh, are the contradictions that we can see uh, in the car market, for instance. Today, one car out of 10 sold in Europe is electric. Car makers managed to cut their average emissions for the first time in five years thanks to electric sales. Yet, if we take a close look at the, at the models that are sold, we can see that electric vehicle market is still motioned by a search for powerful engines. Nearly two-thirds of the top 20 best-selling EVs are SUVs or sedans, much heavier vehicles than conventional cars. This implies that all electric solutions will only prove effective for the climate if they are powered with low carbon energy sources. Yet, while renewable production has reached record high levels in 2020, the mix of major markets like in China, India, the United States, or even in Europe remain overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels. This results in um, a lack of synchronization between uh, the pace of global electrification of end uses and the transition of electricity mixed towards low carbon energies. The world is at an in-between stage where the reduced competitiveness of coal, beneficial for the climate, could also hit vulnerable populations hard without an acceleration of the transition to reduce dependence on fossil fuels in a situation where, as we see this fall uh, around the world, access to gas is highly competitive. This poses issues of justice transition. For instance, we quoted the example of the boom solar in Vietnam. Uh, the expansion has been actually so fast that in many parts of the country, the infrastructure is lagging, with some regions having a surplus of energy and others receiving known for lack of efficient transmission. This is also the case in the US, where a lot of cities are now taking uh, gas bans uh, for new buildings, and they are now entering a fight against gas-rich states, which try to protect their industry and employment. Too slow for the climate, demand for low-carbon goods and services is also going too fast for the adaptation capacity of the global economy supply chains. That's what we've seen this year in, as a result of the pandemic uh, disruptions for the global uh, uh, value chains of many transition goods that are uh, required everywhere. Demand for low carbon uh, technologies have uh, driven inflation on semiconductors, for instance, and strategic metals for transition as nickel, lithium carbonate, and cobalt, with shortages in sight that have been already observed at the start of the year. It means that the growing industries have not escaped to the tensions and breakdowns in global supply chains. It was also intensified by the unbalanced disruptions of container shipping worldwide. Lumber, bicycles, <coughs> semiconductor sectors are facing shortages. Take the record sales of uh, electric vehicles, for instance, in 2020. This, uh, as well as the uh, exponential growth of, of uh, the capacities of renewable energy production facilities and also the high demand for consumer goods and uh, electronic goods during the lockdowns. This is throwing a lot of resources out of the earth, including a lot of metals that are concentrated in a few countries. This means that rather than a transition, we are seeing and witnessing a critical moment of the adaptation of the globalized economy to meet the new requirements of a low carbon world in a context of restrictions and shortages provoked by the pandemic. Although incremental and small scale, regional transition revealed the inadaptation of the global economy to the low carbon future. So how does the world and non-state actors adapt to this new situation? The first thing is the adoption that we've seen in major private groups of carbon neutrality targets. Um, the um, uh, Energy and Climate uh, Intelligence Unit and Oxford Net Zero have shown that 417 of the 200, 2,000 sorry, biggest companies covering one third of the total turnover have net zero targets now. Um, this, is, uh, this has known uh, a major increase over the last two years, ever since the publication of the IPCC report on uh, a global warming of 1.5 degrees. Yet, these net zero commitments uh, um, 
at long term needs to be uh, uh, compared with the pace of short-term action that is actually uh, what is needed, uh, what forms the basis of all scenarios stabilizing global warming under two degrees. <coughs> this trend shows one thing, under pressure from shareholders, NGOs, public opinion to chat the practice, major energy companies are also increasingly aware of the growth opportunities that they have by entering the low carbon markets. If these targets are aligned with Paris Agreement, is the object of close attention by specialized NGOs. In this year's report, what we look is um, we got a lot of interest for carbon intensive industries that have set net zero targets, like all companies, especially European all majors as BP, ENI, Shell, Total Energies, as well as global mining companies as BHP or Rio Tinto. What we see is a close look at their strategic plans show um, a real conviction to become, uh, uh, in, in the next decade, low carbon energy and services companies. How do we see that? Um, take the, the example of oil companies. Most of their emissions are coming up from a scope three emissions, which means that it happened during the conception of oil products. Um, there is no wonder of whether all majors, especially European ones, will do turn towards low carbon energies. The question is, at what pace? Will it be enough to reach uh, the targets of the Paris Agreement? We can see that um, there has been a lot of investment over the last years in hydrogen, carbon capture and, and use and storage, EV charging stations from all these companies. That proves that their intent is to become major players of the global energy markets and not only fossil ones. In some other um, high emitting sectors as aviation, unfortunately, the COSIA offset, uh, offsetting scheme for international aviation effectively is now effectively delayed by uh, actually the pandemic and the lack of emission to compensate for. So uh, the credibility of the carbon neutrality commitments uh, will have to be um, thoroughly scrutinized uh, in, the, in the coming years. Our key takeaways number six uh, um, is showing another form of adaptation to the new low carbon economy, uh, especially coming back to this supply disruption chains that we've talked earlier. Um, companies are driving the low carbon economies toward increasingly concentrated and vertically integrated markets. It means that all major and mining companies, for instance, are both using mergers and acquisition to increase their exposure to low carbon assets by buying emerging companies, signing joint ventures, supplying agreements or purchasing assets. They mostly use external growth to enter clean energy market. This trend is outlining uh, an increasingly concentrated economy in which big companies with massive investment capacities will lead the development of low carbon markets, maybe sometimes to the detriment of smaller companies like municipal companies or uh, citizen cooperatives. Um, increasing competition to access the strategic minerals and raw materials that I talked before as lithium, cobalt, or nickel for lithium ion batteries, for instance, uh, is leading companies to sign long-term contracts to secure supplies. That's what, what, what we've seen, um, for instance, with Tesla um, signing long-term agreements with BHP for their nickel supply or uh, Stellantis and Foxconn joint venture, which has created a big consortium between uh, an, a car maker and uh, a company that is usually uh, in the electronic industry. And now they are joining forces to secure the development of electric car in the next decade through long-term supply agreements. Success of power purchase agreement as well, um, uh, which I'm not quite well known actually, uh, plays a major role in this concentration. These are long-term direct agreements signed between companies and suppliers of renewable electricities, but also big cities as Melbourne or London, or London sorry, have signed such agreements to provide for their need of uh, low carbon electricity. Melbourne, for instance, reached 100% renewables in, the, in its electricity mix uh, in SCOP1 last year. And lots of GAFA companies as Facebook, Google, or Amazon are using such power purchase agreement to feed their energy consumption with renewables. 
The result of this uh, supply chain uh, disruptions and global imbalance is that we've seen a lot of countries and regional groups as the European Union, the United States, but also Japan, Bolivia, Indonesia, or even the province of Quebec in Canada that are trying to shorten the value chains by developing regional supply chains for the manufacture of low carbon technologies as lithium ion batteries, for instance. This is the Airbus of battery in, in the EU. This is also uh, what the US is trying to do right now, relaunching, for instance, its mountain pass mining for uh, rare earth, which was closed for years, and his uh, rare earth market is largely concentrated in, 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 in China. So there is a, a big stake for these countries to find and diversify new sources uh, for their uh, um, supplying of raw materials strategic to the transition. Another sign um, that we see, uh, and this is our key takeaway number seven, um, is the massive investments that have um, uh, increased over the last years in breakthrough technologies, which are in fact gaining credibility. Hydrogen, for instance, recording increasing investment in 2020, plus 12.5%, uh, and so did carbon and capture and use of uh, and storage. Sorry, um, these were quite confidential technologies over the last few years, and they are now gaining tractions um, as net zero targets are becoming the new norm to prove its commitment to engage into a transition, be it at regional level or sectorial level. Oh, my bad. I'm not showing you the, the right slide. Sorry, we can provide you with the PPT later. Um, the global recovery plans as well that, were, uh, that have been implemented by states uh, are betting hard on hydrogen. Um, $19.8 billion uh, were uh, committed over the last year to developing hydrogen. 70 states now have hydrogen strategies. And um, this is the same for uh, CCUS, as more and more states, as Norway, are considering options to capture carbon out of their cement or chemical industries that are, hardly, uh, that are hard to uh, decarbonize. Uh, we can see, for instance, though, so uh, in Norway, a lot of uh, oil companies, again, that are um, taking benefit of their investing capacities thanks to oil revenues to invest into carbon capture and storage. Shell, Total, Equinor are now involved in the Longship project, which was launched in 2020 and aims to capture CO2 from the cement plants and waste incineration systems in Norway. Yet, the uses and production of carbon capture and hydrogen remain largely carbon intensive, and that's what the figures in the slide are showing you. Only 0.3% of uh, hydrogen is sourced from renewable powered electrolysis, which is nothing. So there is a lot to do again uh, ahead of us to decarbonize the hydrogen production, despite all hopes uh, and, and commitments from um, air companies or uh, sea transport or many industries to use hydrogen for their decarbonization. The key takeaway number nine says that with a mix of green and brown investment, recovery is taking an ambiguous turn in several nations. So we've seen there's been a lot of interest for breakthrough technologies um, in, recovery, in recovery plans. Um, there is uh, some kind of an imbalance that we need to uh, scrutinize here. Over the $700 billion that were committed from, for recovery by the G20 countries, 40% go to emitting sectors and 37% to low carbon sectors. This is fact. Yet, the net effect of rescue of strategic emitting sectors during the pandemic and recovery support to low carbon sectors and clean energy are not already assessed. So it needs to be uh, thoroughly scrutinized again in the next few years to see the real impact of these recovery plans. States have also uh, proven crucial to support renewable development uh, in, in technologies like uh, electric vehicle cars, for instance. Many countries in the EU are now taking commitments to phase out thermal cars. Sometimes even car makers are themselves taking commitments that are bolder than states. We've seen some companies 
that are pledging to uh, phase out eternal cars by uh, 2030, while France or Spain are only uh, committed to uh, phase out thermal cars in, in 2014. Uh, State development, uh, state support, sorry, is also crucial for rail deployment. That's what we've seen with the uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which has accounted for um, nearly half of the global uh, rail development in the world in 2020, but also electric heating systems, the adoption of heat pumps, for instance, is highly dependent on strategies um, uh, set by uh, uh, national states. Now we take a look, uh, a closer look at local governments. This is uh, one of the key markers of climate change association identity. Local governments are often drivers of action, but in the context that we've set uh, all across this presentation, we've seen that local governments also intend to adapt the pace of the transition to match the needs and capacities of their communities. Um, as already pointed out in the Local Action Report 2021 that we released uh, last spring, local governments can play a key role in bringing down emissions. For example, in Europe, we saw that where the cities involved in the Covenant of Mayors uh, managed to decrease their emissions by 25% from uh, to, um, uh, 2005 to 2017. This is outpacing uh, the EU's target, actually, according to the John Research Centers. Um, their emission cut targets represent also 28% of the EU overall GHG emission reduction over the period, which is quite huge. It means that few cities are able to uh, represent a massive amount of decarbon um, emission reduction uh, in Europe. We've also seen during the period of the pandemic lots of cities investing in um, relief measures to adapt to the new constraints of um, COVID-19. Um, 1,800 cities in the world have now set measures uh, in support of cycling and walking, and, and especially in Europe, we see that uh, a lot of um, these cycling lanes are now becoming permanent, which is quite important for uh, tracking the progress of these initiatives now. Um, I quoted also the example of uh, the United States earlier in these presentations. Uh, we've seen uh, a movement starting in California, but also Massachusetts. Lots of cities are now banning gas connections in new buildings by creating new standards. Um, this is cutting edge, and this is probably going uh, against uh, uh, the interest of some local industries in gas-rich states, which has resulted in a, in a frontal uh, confrontation between those cities and states uh, which prohibit the cities from taking such measures. So we can see that sometimes the transition, as I said before, if it is going too slow for the climate, is going too fast for uh, the situation of uh, the local economies. And that's the, the type of complexity that we want to highlight in this report. I have to mention also, this is not to be seen here, but in the report that is about to be published on November 29th, you can find a lot of case studies uh, in each sector of emissions that are studied, energy, transport, building, industries, waste, and land use. You will find uh, a lot of case studies describing how local governments and communities are implementing uh, uh, effectively and reaching their targets uh, to abate emissions in partnership with local actors as companies and citizens. For instance, we highlight uh, the emergence of the fifth generation heating and cooling system uh, that has been put in place in many cities across Europe, but also in the world, uh, with a case study from uh, Heel in the Netherlands in partnership with Construction 21. This is something that needs to be said. This report is a collective report um, relying on the expertise of a lot of uh, partner, uh, partner organizations and we're happy to uh, uh, thank them for uh, their unconditional support and contribution to this report. Let me finish with the last key takeaway of this presentation. I'm so sorry that you couldn't see the previous uh, slides. Um, we want to finish with civil society, which has, which has played a crucial role in 2020 to um, change the movement of transition in many cities and countries. Especially, we noticed that shareholder activism has seen civil society extend its scope of action. 
Over the last year, climate change uh, uh, documented in its report the inflation of climate lawsuits. Uh, according to the UNEP, 1,500 cases on climate were underway in July 2020. And this is not enough to say that. We need to keep track of uh, the results of these climate lawsuits. We've seen many successes in France being condemned by different tribunals uh, from cases that were launched by cities like Grand Saint or uh, NGOs as the Affaire du siècle. Uh, this is also the case in the Netherlands uh, that had to set mandatory uh, uh, climate, uh, where the tribunal set mandatory climate policy shift uh, to the, uh, the Dutch govern, um, government after it was condemned by the tribunal of uh, La Hague um, regarding the um, inadequacy of its measures uh, to reach its 2020 climate targets. But we've also seen um, some uh, uh, failures from uh, uh, NGOs, which uh, uh, are uh, quite disappointing in terms of climate impact. For instance, Supreme Court in UK finally allowed the Heathrow Airport extension after the first tribunal uh, uh, suspended it. Aside from this movement, as I said before, shareholder activism uh, is uh, harvesting more and more success. 85 resolutions on climate were put forward in 2021, and they are reaping uh, more and more favorable votes. We've seen an especially incredible day on May 26th. Uh, um, when uh, three oil companies were uh, condemned at the same time, both by climate justice and shareholder activism, when uh, Shell was condemned by the Tribunal of La Hague to uh, uh, reduce its carbon emissions, when Chevron, uh, the American company, was uh, Chevron shareholders actually voted uh, for the company to reduce its own emissions, and when uh, engine number one, uh, an activist uh, hedge fund, managed to put three directors at the board of ExxonMobil. We've also seen different sorts of uh, successes, especially Keystone XL pipeline that was cancelled by Joe Biden uh, earlier this year, but also many coal-fired plants that are cancelled uh, uh, under the pressure of uh, uh, protest uh, from the population uh, at local level. And this is bearing fruits again uh, uh, to uh, phase out fossil fuels out of the, uh, the electricity mixes. And we have an especially interesting case that will be the object of a full analysis in the report in Indonesia, where we've seen that palm oil industry, uh, palm oil industry sorry, improves transparency under pressure from foreign markets and local NGOs, but that deforestation results, which were really positive over the last four years, uh, are maybe endangered by the lift of the moratorium on new palm oil uh, that was decided by the government uh, this uh, September. These are many examples uh, that you can find in the report. There is many more to come, and we are pleased to talk with you later this, today uh, to give you with further analysis and examples. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Antoine. It, it's very difficult to resume uh, the report uh, in uh, 30 minutes because the report is uh, uh, each year on uh, two, three, four hundred uh, pages uh, with uh, a lot of detail. We analyze uh, uh, sector by sector. And, uh, but uh, I think that uh, this year is an important year. We, we see clearly this difference between the, uh, the principal region of the world. We, we see uh, clearly the, the new strategy of uh, the principal energy uh, company at the world level. Uh, we see the development of renewable energy, but it's not, uh, it's more an accumulation, as Antoine uh, said, that uh, a translation, because uh, the, there is a growing of uh, conception of, uh, of energy, of electricity. You, uh, you, you know that. And uh, we present the complete report uh, November in November. And uh, in end of November, we organize uh, some debate, sector by sector, uh, in link with the presentation of the, of the complete uh, report. Um, th thank you, uh, Antoine. Thank you to, to the team, to Samuel, uh, to Virginie to organize this, uh, this press conference. Of course, we have time after the press conference uh, outside uh, to discuss uh, with you. Um, I underline that it's, I think it's always at the one level, the principal report 
who try to analyze the reality of the effort, the reality of action to decrease or not decrease uh, CO2 uh, emissions. And uh, maybe uh, to conclude, because we try to be optimistic, we, we see some, some real concrete result as local government. As Antoine said, 28% of the decreasing of CO2 emissions uh, in Europe, it's uh, the action, the local action of local government. It's, n it's not nothing, it's not nothing. We see that when we have this mobilization, when we have this, this consistency, this coherence between all the, the policy at the local level, there is real r result. Uh, it's to finish with uh, an optimistic uh, note, but uh, we know that th this world is a complex world and uh, we have time to discuss outside. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.